Uh, good morning, everybody, or good afternoon. Um, it's been a long morning. Um, I, I've been sitting uh, in the front there for most of the time listening, uh, and I'm sure it's dangerous for speakers to um, come between an audience and their lunch. Uh, it's even more dangerous to do it in Italy before Italian food. So I'm going to try and be brief. Uh, I was, as I was listening to a, a theologian and a philosopher, as I was listening to an economist uh, and others, I was wondering what, what I was doing here. And then I realized I was the warm-up act for Mad Men this afternoon. So it, it came home a little bit more. But I'm going to try and be practical because um, I am trying to run um, a multinational company uh, and I'm absorbed... I was going to say with the next quarter or the next half or the next year, and I should really put it, I'm absorbed really with the next two to three years. That's my time horizon. It's not just a question of a quarter or six months or a year. So I'm looking really at the short term, and I, I really can't wait for politicians, theologians, sociologists, or observers to come to a conclusion. So my, my needs and the needs of the 168,000 people inside WPP in 108 countries, their needs are really to deal with the realities of the moment. So I want to focus on three things. Firstly, I want to tell you a little bit about our strategy. It's not an ad for WPP. It's really just uh, saying what we regard as being important and that reflects the lenses that our clients have, if we've analyzed it correctly, and brings those home sharply, I, th I think, to you in terms of what we're trying to do. Secondly, I want to talk a little bit about what has happened post Lehman. You know, I come from London, or I came from London last, last night, and we've seen and we will see today unfolding more momentous and I think very significant events, which will be the beginning of further events in the financial services sector, not just in the UK but elsewhere, which, which carry on from those times because the issues that Barclays are facing really emanate from that time of 2008. Now, one observation I would just make is that the change that has taken place since 2008, interestingly, has not resonated as much with consumers as it's resonated with corporates. And I'm going to come back to that because I think the most significant change in behavior since September the 12th and 13th, 2008, is not amongst consumers. It has affected consumers in that they look at price-value relationships much more sharply, not at the high end, but at the medium and low ends. But where it's resonated most has been with corporates. And I'll come back to that and, and the way they behave. Their behavior has changed, and I believe has changed for, to say forever is a long time, but very, for a very significant period of time. So I, I want to talk a little bit about what's happened since 2008. And finally, I want to give you 10 things that we see going on that might be of some practical value as you analyze what, not only what's going on in Italy, not only what's going on in uh, Western Europe, Europe as a whole, and you remember I make the distinction between Western and Eastern Europe. I don't make the distinction between North and South that, that Dominique made before. I make the distinction between West and East, and I'll come back to that in a minute. Not just for Western Europe but for the, and, and Eastern Europe, but for the world as a whole. So, firstly, let's go to the strategy. Very simple. Our strategy is one sentence. New markets, that means the BRICS and Next 11. New media, that means digital. Consumer insight, that means data analytics and the application of technology. And lastly, horizontality. Now, I was very struck by uh, the chairman's analogy to an orchestra. When, when there's a chill wind, people huddle together. And when there's a chill wind, not only should they huddle together, but their strength comes from combination, not fragmentation. And what horizontality means to us is looking at our clients on a worldwide basis, 
not on a functional basis or a geographic basis, and looking at countries as whole. So I met, for example, with about 30 of our people this morning. We have 2,200 people here in Italy. We have revenues here of about $400 million in comparison to about $16 billion worldwide. That was the figure last year. And that together, working together, that group can be much more powerful than if they are split asunder and act in a fragmented way. I think the, the biggest challenge for corporations, whether they be clients, whether they be media owners, or whether they be agencies, is the inability or unwillingness of people to cooperate with one another. So I started WPP with one other person 27 years ago with two people in one room in London, and we had a coordination problem. Today we have 168,000 people, and you can imagine the multiplicity of coordination problems. Internal politics is the biggest issue that companies have to deal with. It's not the externalities, in my view, it's the internal. So internal organization is critically important. So that's the strategy. Just to repeat, new markets, new media, consumer insight, and horizontality. Now, what's happened in our view since 2008? If any of you have not read Andrew Ross Sorkin's book, Too Big to Fail, uh, you should read it. I don't know whether it's been translated into Italian, but if you can read it either in Italian or, or English, please do, because it tells you how close we came to a financial catastrophe on September the 12th and 13th, 2008. Jeff Immelt in that book is quoted, it's been denied by GE, but he is quoted in that book as having said that, that GE was within 48 hours of being unable to refund or, or, or refinance its corporate obligations. Warren Buffett has said that it was American's financial Pearl Harbor. However you describe it, it was a seminal moment. It started in August 2007 with the subprime crisis. It went through the insurance monoline crisis. It went through Bear Stearns, and it culminated with Lehman. But the financial world, at least, nearly came to an end. Since that point in time, consumer behavior has changed, not so much at the the top end, at the, the premium price end, although there are some signs currently, interestingly, in places like Hong Kong and China, of some starting some changes in, in premium price behavior by consumers, but certainly in the middle levels and lower, little, lower levels, consumer behavior has become, as you would expect, much more focused on price value. But what was really interesting about 2008, or that, that weekend, was we, we saw in the fourth quarter of 2008 very little impact. The big impact came in the first half of 2009, when we as an organization failed to readjust as much as possible, as much as we should have done, because corporates really did think that 2009, the world was coming to an end. And all bets were off. Expenditure was reduced. We budgeted minus two on our top line. It actually came in at minus eight. And corporates were saying in 2009, we really have to batten down the hatches, primarily because of the liquidity problem. And interestingly, in 2010 and 2011, and we're seeing it again in 2012, when they realized that the world didn't come to an end, when the massive infusion of Keynesian stimulus in 2009, which totaled, in our view, $12 trillion against a worldwide GDP of $65 trillion. So 20% of GNP was infused by governments, basically, in a period of 18 months. When the world didn't come to an end, life didn't resume, but it resumed at different speeds. And what we don't understand in Western Europe, and you know, maybe I say somewhat controversially, but I disagree with with Dominic and his, and his analysis that the West can recover quite in the way that he mentioned. I think it, it needs different things. But what, the, what we discovered in 2010 and 11 and 12 to date is that the world is moving at different speeds. It's moving geographically at different, different speeds. It's moving functionally at different speeds. And you have to tailor what you do to those to those different speeds. You know, I like the football analogy. Maybe I shouldn't mention football, maybe I should. 
uh, I like the football analogy, there is a, a Premier League. And whether we like it in the West, and particularly in Western Europe or not, it is the bricks of the next 11. It's our inability to come to terms with that that is causing the problem. It's the arrogance, whether it was because of the financial crisis or whatever, the arrogance of the West. You see, I, I think we've been here before. When I was listening to Dominic's presentation in particular, it reminded me of the story that in the early 19th century, because this has been a very intellectual morning, it reminded of the story in the early 19th century when China and India were 50% of worldwide GMP. That's only 200 years ago. It was 50%, which is where Goldman Sachs predict it will be shortly, again. And in, those, in that early 19th century, there were two, two porcelain companies, one in Germany called Meissen, and one in, in the UK called Wedgwood. And they were producing the same quality Chinese porcelain at lower prices as the Chinese were producing in China when China was dominant. We've been here before. This is a cyclical phenomenon, and we can get out of it if there are basic changes in leadership and emphasis. I mean, the, the Boccioni presentation, philosophically, I agree with. Reducing the rate of government spending, investing that, that reduction in, in or stimulating the economy in tax cuts, I would agree with the UK coalition government actually haven't cut spending. They've reduced the rate of increase and are embarked on a similar course. Let's hope that they've got it right. But it, it, essentially, it's, it, we have to come to terms with the fact that the world is operating at different speeds and we've seen it both functionally and geographically. And it's not, you shouldn't get depressed in Italy or the UK or France or Germany by that phenomenon. Maybe I put Germany to one side. The Premier League is Brixen next 11. The second, the, the, the Championship League is Germany and the United States. Never under, underestimate the United States. The next division, Division I as we would call it in the UK, is Italy and France and Spain and the UK. And the, the second division I would say is Japan. Japan is going through a bit of a renaissance at the minute, post the tragedy of Fukushima and the investment that's being made, but I don't think it will come out of the lethargy. The world, what was the world's second biggest economic engine has been stagnant for 20 years. And I don't think it shows any fundamental sign, secular sign, of changing. So, Strategically, what we've seen is a change in 10, 11, and 12, where corporates have realized that the world's moving at different speeds, have started to realize the impact of digital and the changes, and started, have started to invest accordingly. But what you've got is a very sort of strange phenomenon. Because if you look at the structure of companies, of our client companies, you look at the US-based multinationals, they have $2 trillion of cash sitting on their balance sheet, relatively unleveraged. If I look at UK-based multinationals, it's about 750 billion pounds, or about a, a, a trillion dollars, sitting on their balance sheets unused, uninvested. Why? In the mature markets, they're not investing in capacity. In the fast-growing markets where they're getting growth, they're investing in capacity and behind the brand. Interestingly, in the mature markets, they're not investing in capacity, but they are investing in the brand. You can't explain the fact that we had a record year last year, other than, and most of our competitors had a very good year, you can't explain it other than companies are looking at the mature markets and not expanding their capacity, but they are investing in the brand to maintain share or increase share. And in the faster growing markets where they can see the growth, they invest in capacity and behind the brands. Now, mistakenly, I think in the mature markets, they make the argument if they invest in advertising and marketing, it's a variable expense and they can cut it. We don't agree with that, obviously. We're talking our own book, it's true. But everything that you see in terms of academic and practical research tells you 
that companies that invest in brands over the long period and consistently win. They win because their top line grows faster than their competition who cuts and tries to restore spending. It's very expensive to restore it. And they gain at the bottom line too. The, I would commend you to look at the Deutsche Bank analysis for 15 or 20 years that has consistently shown that companies that invest in their brands consistently over periods of time do better top line and bottom line. Those who cut don't. It's as simple as that. So if you take two things out of this, what I'm talking about for half an hour or so, read Andrew Ross Sorkin's book and read the, the Deutsche Bank analysis. And maybe third, third thing on the reading list is Jim O'Neill's analysis of BRICS and Next 11 at Goldman. And if anybody needs it, just send me an email, msorrell at wpp.com, and I'll supply you with it. Not the book, but the articles. So, strategically, what we've seen in 2008 is an acceptance, I think, of the world moving at different speeds and a conservatism in the way that companies operate. This is not a lack of confidence. Companies are operating at the highest levels of profitability, at the highest levels of margins, profits as a proportion of GMP are at the highest levels that we've seen historically, although in the last six months or so, people have started to get a bit nervous about that. But basically, they're in very good condition, unstretched, their balance sheets are much better in 2012 than they were in 2008. Consumers' balance sheets are generally a little bit better. Governments, we can argue whether they are or not. Some are, like the Germans, some aren't, like other countries. So that's the, the basic background position. So let me just then, then move, having said a little bit about our strategy and what the pattern of behavior since 2008, to what we see happening, 10 things that we see happening. And the first, you know, everybody has mentioned it, is this shift to the, to the east. But it's not just the shift to the east. It's a shift to the south. Now, by the way, I'm talking about the center of the world being New York. Americans say that the center of the world is New York, and I, I tend to agree with them. Politically, it's Washington, D.C. Commercially, it's New York. And when I talk about the central point, the shift is to the east. Obviously, everybody talks about China and India, but it's also to the south. This is the decade of Latin America. I shouldn't have to say that or you should understand that very well in Italy, because Italian companies, multinationals, have penetrated Latin America, maybe not so much Brazil, but certainly uh, the rest of Latin America, but also Brazil, have penetrated it quite significantly. Yeah, the, the, the growth of Latin America, in my view, is now assured. We've gone through that takeoff stage. There will be bumps. It will be high, higher risk, higher reward. But the growth that we're seeing in Brazil, which continues right through to the present moment, having looked at the, the numbers at WPP for the first five months, Latin America is the strongest growing region, and Brazil is the strongest growing country within that region, all growing at around 14 to 15% like-for-like -like growth, excluding currency and excluding acquisitions. We will have the World Cup in Brazil in 2014, we will have the Olympics in Rio in 2016. It may sound a strange thing to say, say, but the power of these live events in the repositioning or positioning of a country and a continent are extremely powerful. Just look at Beijing, what it did, Beijing Olympics did for China and, and the East and Asia. Look at what the World Cup did in South Africa, not just for South Africa, but the continent of South Africa. You will see, in our view, the same thing happened for Brazil and Latin America. So this is the decade of South America. Luis Moreno, the, the president of the IBD, the Inter-American Development Bank, the development institution, has said this. We're working with him on a creative campaign for Latin America. This is their decade. So it's to the south, and it's to the southeast too. Africa and the Middle East are also growing at extremely rapid rates, driven by commodity booms and improves, improvement in agricultural prices, it's true. But again, they're taking off in terms of economic development. I think these things are irreversible. Obviously, some of the former speakers disagree with that. I think this is a long-term secular change 
um, and a long -term, or a long-term cyclical change that it is very difficult uh, for us to deal with or compete with unless we change the structure of our economies markedly and, and leadership is much stronger. Not dissimilar, by the way, to what we saw in the 1980s. If you go back to the 1980s, people were saying Japan would run the world and America would be eclipsed. And along came leaders like whatever you think of them, like Ronald Reagan or Margaret Thatcher, with a decisive and focused point of view, whether you disagree with them or not, and implemented their leadership. So the first thing is that shift, that geographical shift. The second thing is in every, in every industry, virtually every industry that we operate in, there is significant overcapacity. Our biggest client is Ford Motor Company. You would think post Lehman, there had been a reduction in the supply of autos and trucks around the world. There has not been. The world can still produce 80 million units. And the reason is, although capacity has been reduced in the United States, it's been increased in China, in India, in Korea. Hyundai is now a major force in the auto industry. People used to, particularly in Detroit, used to look with some disdain at Hyundai and Kia. They don't anymore. That is probably the biggest threat competitively to the big three in Detroit and indeed other car manufacturers around the world. But the simple fact is, because of that rebalancing of supply, you can still produce 80 million units and consumers can only consume around 60 million. I just remind you that the US car market has gone from 18 million units to about 13 million units and the Chinese market has gone to about 18 million units. The Chinese market is now the biggest in the world. Some people forecast it will go to 32 million units. So just think about those shifts. European market, I think, is around 16 or 17 million units. So basically, we've got overcapacity. Where's the shortage of shortages in human capital? If you look at the demographics of every major country, including the fast growth countries, for example, in Mexico or Pakistan, at some point in time, shortly into the future, birth rates decline, elongation of life, I think previous speaker mentioned uh, 90, 90 years, it goes beyond that. There's a 50-50 shot of a baby being born in Europe now reaching 100 years. So elongation of life means that the extension, the death rate does not counterbalance the birth rate, and we get a, cons a constriction on the supply of talent. So if you think there is a fight for talent now, a war for talent now, just wait over the next 5, 10, 15 years. Every company, whether they believe they're capital intensive or not, will be involved in the war for talent. So finding, motivating, incentivizing, keeping people will be critical. The third point is the rise of the web. Uh, it's been talked about enough this morning. You know about it enough. I mean, Italy is not a country yet, in our view, at WPP, that has embraced the web as aggressively as it should. Uh, the web is probably, if you include e-commerce in this country, about 15, 16%, maybe around that level. We know that consumers spend one-third of their time online or on mobile. There's a disconnect there. In fact, if I threw, threw up a graph of where we spend money, I'm not talking about Italy now, I'm talking about the world, where we spend money in consultation with our clients as opposed to where consumers spend their time, there are two major disconnects. Interestingly, television is about right. What we spend and where consumers spend their time on TV is about right. Outdoor is about right. Radio is about right. But there are two big disconnects. And some people in the audience are not going to like me for saying this, but I, one of our clients said before I started, just tell it as you see it, so I'm going to tell you as I see it, or as we see it. Press, consumers are spending, according to the data that we have and others have, about 9% of their time. We're investing 19% of our budgets worldwide in press. Internet, we're spending about 19% of our budgets. Consumers are spending one-third of their time on online and mobile. Those two things have to change. 
So the prospects for legacy press, and I understand, underline legacy press, are not bright. And the prospects for internet and mobile are very bright. And this, in this eternal debate as to whether Apple got, has got it right, Amazon has got it right, Google's got it right, Facebook's got it right, just let me make one observation. The company, obviously, Apple has got it right. Obviously, Amazon has got it right. But the one company, really, that I think has got the biggest potential power is Google. Google has five legs to it, which are extremely powerful. The first leg is the traditional leg of search, where it is dominant, and I use that word deliberately. The second area that it has is display. The third area is video, i.e. YouTube. The fourth area is social, some dispute as to whether Google Plus is working as well as it should, but it, it's making ground. And the last and most significant, in our view, is mobile. It has just acquired Motorola, Motorola Mobility, has got permission from the regulator for that. If it manages to link hardware with software, with its Android platform, it is immensely powerful. And just to give you an example, we manage a media book of about $75 billion around the world. Our biggest spend is probably with News Corp at around two and a half billion. This year, Google will approach News Corp in terms of size. So last year, we spent 1.6 billion with Google. This year, it, will be, it is tracking in the first five months of this year well over two billion. Facebook was 200 million. We targeted 400 million this year. It is not tracking at that rate yet, but it gives you an idea of relative size. And one observation on, on, on the web, because people ask me this, I was asked this again this morning before we started. My view, and this is my view, not necessarily the company's view, is that Facebook is not an advertising medium. It's a very powerful branding medium. It is a communication network. It is a social network. It is not an advertising network. Search is an advertising-driven process. Social communication is a brand. If you get people to say nice things on Facebook about you, that is very powerful in the long term. Difficult to measure in the short term, by the way, but very powerful in the long term. Search is something that is much more contextually correct for advertising. So the rise and rise of the web is important because you still have the disintermediation risk if you're in a legacy and traditional business. You're disintermediated by people who are evaluated on different criteria by investors, by consumers and others. And lastly, looping back to the talent point, talent likes, young talent in particular, likes the idea of working in technologically savvy companies which are much more entrepreneurial and much, much less bureaucratic. The fourth point that we see is the growth of retail power. Despite the fact that Walmart, Tesco and Carrefour all have issues of facing of varying degrees of difficulty, the power of retail continues to increase. So just to remind you that Walmart is the 13th largest country in terms of retail sales in the world. It used to be the seventh, actually. But last time I checked, it was about $500 billion of sales, and it would rank on its own as the 13th largest country by retail sales. So it has immense power. That power, particularly in difficult economic times, is being targeted particularly against the manufacturers, particularly against the packaged goods manufacturers, with the growth not only of, of private label and own label, but because of the, the use of leverage and buying power. And what you've had in the last 20 years is very little consumer price inflation. You've seen commodity price inflation, but packaged goods manufacturers in particular have had limited pricing power. And what the retailers have done have put pressure on the, on the packaged goods companies. They've had commodity price increases. Their margins have, have been squeezed. And that has create, created uh, the tension that we see, which not many people talk about, it's fair to say, but the tension between the retailer uh, and the manufacturer. And it's manifested itself in the growth and importance of trade communication, of channel communication, uh, what we call shopper marketing. That is becoming more and more as, as powerful, I would argue, as the growth of digital. 
So commanding or influencing the trade and the consumer in store and understanding that is becoming more important. Obviously, the growth of the social media makes that easier. You can take Procter's investment <coughs> in Okada in the UK, which is a, home, a, a direct shopping uh, operation in grocery, as an example of that, investing directly in the, in the direct-to-consumer channel to get a better understanding. So that growth of retail power is incredibly important. The fifth area is in internal communications. The biggest challenge that any chairman or CEO has inside any company, we would argue, is communicating internally. Just look at what Bob Diamond did before he resigned at Barclays. The last act was to send a 1,900-word piece of communication internally to his people. At that time, he had not made his, his decision to resign, but sending it internally to his people to tell them what was going on. That was just a, an example, the latest example that I've seen of the importance of internal communication. I'm trying to run a company which is multi-branded and has grown by acquisition. That, I would argue, is the most difficult model to communicate in. A unibranded company, one brand, which has grown organically, which is stronger than growth by acquisition, is probably a more easy one to do. But the problems are very intense. And if you can get the internal communi communities online uh, and in line, you have a very powerful communications device externally to customers, to suppliers, to government, to NGOs, to journalists, to trade journalists, to analysts and the like. The sixth thing that we see going on is, whilst it's true that there is more global focus from companies, that power is moving to the center, wherever the center is, it is also true there is more power coming to local management. Because of the size of companies, because of their complexity, because of the need to deal with governments on a country-by-country -country basis, to deal with R&D, to deal with recruitment, to deal with corporate social sustainability issues and responsibility issues, local management in a, in a, in a not a funny way, but in a, a, a way are being more and more balanced. So we're seeing a sort of a, 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 a dumbbell, as we would call it. So you've got the, the global focus and you've got the local focus. And we're very focused on that with country managers where we're trying to get people to focus on the best people in the country, the, the companies that are going to be the multinationals of the future or the big national companies of the future, and of course, acquisition prospects. So trying to get an understanding of what's going on locally is equally important. What is getting squeezed in our view is regional management. And the growth of technology makes the, the dissemination of information up or down or in a net network basis now much, much easier. So we think that that focus on global and local is going to continue. The seventh point is, is a difficult point to raise, but I, you know, again, stimulated by uh, the, the request to tell it as it is. We have seen, particularly since 2008, the rise of finance and procurement inside client companies. And I think we would have to say, and we are talking our own book, or I am talking my own book because I represent the industry in one way, shape, or form, or partly in one, one way, shape, or form, I have to say that the balance inside client companies has gone too far to finance and procurement. Client companies, as that Deutsche Bank analysis shows, will not win by cutting costs. There is a finite limit to what you can do to cut, to cut costs. However, at least in theory, and at least until you get to 100% market share, there is no limit to what you can do in increasing the top line. But what was ha happened because of what I said before, of this low inflation, commodity price inflation, squeeze on margins, there's an internal focus on procurement and finance, which in our view is too intense. And marketing has lost power. We obviously think that's a mistake. There are some signs of that changing but they're equally signs of it intensifying in this demand for efficiency, which is lower cost, effectiveness, which is better work, which we totally agree with, and indeed 
uh, and, and indeed liquidity, because liquidity post-2008 has also become important. But that relative balance, in our view, has become distorted, and we think it has to change. The eighth point, and I, I don't have to say this in Italy, or, or indeed in the UK, is the growth of government. Um, government, as I mentioned, had injected something like 20% of worldwide GMP in 18 months post Lehman. The government is here to stay. If you look at the historic precedent for what we're going through now, and I hate to be gloomy, but it is the 1930s. And it took us 10 years to get out of a recession, and sadly, we had to go to war to get us out of a recession. I'm not advocating that in any way whatsoever as a solution. But this is a long-term issue. I mean, talking to our people here in Italy, I, I don't think we can bank at WPP that that the Western economic situation is going to change for at least two to three years. We're going to have to cope with capacity constraint and focus on cost, and I've, I've told you what I think about that, I think for the next two or three years. There are growth spots like digital, like data analytics, like the application of technology, and maybe Hicks Boson will, 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 will change our business too, as well as the energy business. But the, growth, the importance of government as a client is growing more and more. So government is not going to go away. It's going to be important, not just as a regulator, but as an investor, stimulator, and client. The ninth point is sustainability. I, I don't think anybody, any one of our clients, takes... CSR or sustainability, corporate social responsibility or sustainability for granted. If I was talking to you five years ago, maybe there was some greenwash going on. Maybe it wasn't totally genuine, but I do think now that all our clients, without exception, I think I can make that statement, regard sustainability and the issues surrounding it at the core and center of what they do strategically and structurally. If I went through the list of our top 10 clients, every one of them, the chairman and CEO are front and center on this area. So there is an acceptance now totally that doing good is good business. It is not charity. It is not altruism. It is about doing good to improve the position of the company, its corporate brand and its uh, operating brands in all the communities and with all the stakeholders that you have to deal with. And the last point, and here I'll finish, uh, is, is what is the result of, of some of these pressures, or their opportunities and pressures, uh, on our industry? And I think, you know, people look at WPP, and I, I, I've spent 27 years at WPP, and, and nine years prior to that at Sarches, and they look at that, and, and th those 36 years have been years of consolidation in our industry. Primarily because of the cost pressures, primarily for, from clients, procurement and finance, that is going to result, in my view, in, in further consolidation in our industry. I'm not saying that we will be at the forefront of it. You know, we're probably big enough in many of the things, in many of the things that we do and the, the countries that we operate in. But I'm talking about the industry as a whole. Those pressures inevitably will make it more difficult for smaller businesses to flourish. Uh, I'm not saying that's a good thing. I think it's probably a bad thing, but it will make it more difficult. And we'll put pressure further on consolidation. So the, the last point I would make is that the sort of pressures that we're seeing, particularly in Western Europe and the United States, will result in further consolidation in our sector. I believe media owners, we will see further consolidation amongst legacy media owners and maybe in, even in the, the new media owners, uh, and I think we'll see further consolidation amongst clients. So, thank you very much. Yes.